As a former Deputy General Secretary of the NDC. So now there's a lot of things at the training school that the NDC has. But it's here in flesh and blood. Good morning, Doc. How are you doing? Good morning, Johnny. Good to see you. Good to see you too. How is your party doing? NDC is doing great. Are you sure? We're doing great. When you say you're doing great, what exactly do you mean? What I simply mean is that we are poised for power mm. and the party is ready both in preparation and uh, in, in campaigning mm -hmm. and all that. And I'm sure you saw yeah, yeah. some uh, modicum of that in Tamale last weekend. Mm. The NDC is ready to lead this country. We are ready to form government. We are ready to fix the economy. Mm -hmm. And we are ready to take off. The key opposition party, which is now in power, the MPP says the alternative is scary and that you are not ready. What I mean, do you say that's that's most ridiculous. When anybody says the alternative is scary, I'm mm. wondering what kind of alternative they are looking at. Mm. Because if if what we see is fine, it's not scary, then I don't know what <laughs> scary means. Mm. So I mean, we have proven beyond reasonable doubt mm. our last opportunity in government that we are exceedingly better mm. than our friends in power. Mm -hmm. We have everything to show. Is it not surprising that after eight years, everything that this government would want to thrive on is an NDC project that they started? Mm -hmm. President Mahama spent only four years in government and across sectors, from agriculture to health to education, mm -hmm. his, his, his achievements are replete. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to struggle, you know, to, to see his achievements. Mm -hmm. You throw your eyes anywhere, wherever you pass, and you see President Mahama right there. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if anybody throws that jargon, Alternative is scary. How scary? Mm -hmm. I mean, scary is when you have a government that is so reckless in mm -hmm. spending. You have a government that is corrupt to the core. Mm -hmm. A government that that will, would rip the nation of its resources. Mm -hmm. And when you go and complain, they attack you physically. They either kill you mm -hmm. or you are sent to jail. Kill who? Well, Ahmed Swali accused president and he died. We have seen in elections eight people died. Mm. It, I mean, it has never been seen in this country before. Mm. And that's what is scary. Mm. When journalists cannot talk, you talk mm. today, you are in the cells tomorrow. I mean, that's more scary. And so if you are looking at scary alternatives, you have it right there. Mm. Now, you are the director of inter-party and civil society organizations. What is your relationship with the civil society, um, you know, environment and the climate? Well, first of all, let me make the point that the NDC as a social democratic party mm -hmm. and having its roots from formation by various identifiable groups, and that's why the NDC is called the National Democratic Congress. Mm -hmm. It's made up of various groups, some of which were civil society organizations at the time when the NDC was being formed. Believe that inclusion should mm -hmm. be key mm -hmm. to governance, and for that matter if you would succeed mm -hmm. as a government your interaction your collaboration and partnership mm -hmm. with identifiable organizations civil society and so on mm -hmm. is crucial and so two years ago we set up this department to lead the outreach mm -hmm. to the various organizations and um, the past few years we have been doing that vigorously you would recall that even in the preparation towards our 2020 manifesto, right. we started this mass you know, request mm -hmm. from the public for public memoranda and so on and so right. forth, reaching out to various organizations and all that. And I recall our friends were teasing us that, oh, and this you lack ideas. And mm -hmm. so that's why you are out there looking for ideas and all that. But we believe that yeah. wisdom yeah. does not lie in one man's head. So we may know all the alternatives, mm -hmm. but when you listen to the people, you are able to connect to their failing. And there's nothing better than connecting to the failings of the ordinary people and trying mm -hmm. to fix them. I heard you talking about the market people That's and right. all those people. Mm -hmm. If you don't engage them, mm -hmm. you may think that you are formulating policy because perhaps you have gone to the university, you studied public policy and all blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, economics and all that. But you may not understand mm. the real feeling and expectations of the people mm -hmm. in the public policy formulation if you don't go to mm -hmm. them. And that is why stakeholder consultation is very crucial in public policy formulation. Mm -hmm. And so our department in the past few months have been doing mm -hmm. quite a number of engagements 
we have been meeting various trade unions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have virtually met almost all the trade unions, uh, except a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, the process is still on. We have met several civil society organizations mm -hmm. and other identifiable groups and all that. The main import is to listen to them and to hear their expertise. Mm -hmm. Because, Taflache, you can be a professor, mm -hmm. but they will learn you in the, mm -hmm. at the show now. Right. When it comes to fishing, Mm -hmm. He is a professor there. Right. And the fact that you are a professor doesn't mean that you are a professor. You may even be a professor in fisheries. Right. And you cannot beat the Wulenyu at the Nshona. Mm. And so our attempt has been to bridge the gap of knowledge, mm -hmm. get close to them, have a feel of what they do, have a feel of their expectations, have a feel of what they are thinking, so that we can consolidate that into public policy mm. as part of our manifesto processes. And so we have been doing that the past, in fact, we have been doing that for the past four years. Mm. Because after the 2020 elections, President Mahama decided not to dissolve the manifesto committee, even though it was an ad hoc committee formed right. for that purpose. Right. Um, we transmogrified that into a think tank, mm. what we call the NDC lab. Mm. And we had been working for the past four years. Mm. Until last year when the preparation of the manifesto uh, uh, started um, I mean, coming up, consolidating. So then we had to do this continuous rigorous engagements. Mm -hmm. Most of the institutions, we have met them about two or three times. Right. I heard you talk about Guta. We have met Guta. We have met the Private Enterprises Federation. We have almost all those, you know, uh, unions, trade union congress. We have met the uh, transport and oil marketers. Mm -hmm. And we have listened to them. Mm -hmm. And we have come to a point where we believe that our knowledge of the economy, the deterioration, the decay, mm -hmm. It's, it's not even a, 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 an inch of what exactly the decay is. Listening to some of them, you will see the extent of the mess that we have caused, mostly led by government. So, so somebody says that, look, in opposition, political parties and political actors listen to these civil society organizations. In power, they shut their ears. And in the last few years, we have seen um, what hasn't Imani said? What hasn't IDEC said? What hasn't CDD said? What hasn't uh, name them? ASEPA, ASEP, name them. They have said things. I remember that in the early days of the government, I think in 2018 or so, um, CDD did a survey to say that 9 billion was lost to corruption. The government says it's a lie. We have not lost it's 9 billion. Worse than that. And, and, but the government says it's a lie and they didn't provide alternative figures and up until now we don't know how much was lost to corruption or has been lost well to corruption the auditor general speak. has been giving out some well, well he's some been even giving us figures those are misappropriations you know mispayments and all of those ones but cdd had done a separate one aside it that look we lost x amount to corruption be, beside what the, or beyond what the other general the government said no so the question is in opposition you listen to them when you get the power, you forget about them. You see them as uh, acrimonious societies and not collaborative group, groups. What, what do you say? Rather contrary to that, um, if you look at our history, history as a party and our engagement with civil society, it has been very much cordial. And uh, we have listened more to social uh, organizations, I mean, civil society organizations, um, even religious organizations than our friends. And uh, I, I recall when we were in government, the civil society space was very vibrant. I mean, that was when you hear Imani every single day on every matter. You hear CDD here, you hear IDEC here. I mean, they were all over the place. And it was so because we had created an environment that exudes some confidence, that makes them feel that your opinion matter. And, and for that matter, when they speak, there's somebody who would listen. There's somebody who would call them and say, okay, what are you talking about? How do we do this? How do we work this together? Contrary to that, we have a system now where the, the, the general environment does not even give vent to opinion from civil society organizations. And as we engage them, one of the biggest worries of civil society mm -hmm. in Ghana today mm -hmm. is the fact that government does not listen. Okay. Government does not even give them the opportunity mm. to vent. 
does not give them opportunity for engagement, mm. does not collaborate or partner with them. Mm -hmm. Rather, government hunts them. Yeah. So they are sources of finance, they are sources of vent. What gets them going? Government actually attacks those sources so that they would be ineffective. And you would bear with me. We have been in this country. Right. You have seen how the civil society organizations had operated in the past. Mm. No civil society organization is operating like that. Last time we met GII, mm -hmm. and I was decrying why corruption has gotten to these humongous levels and GI is quiet. As a government and I, in, uh, integrity, integrity yes, initiative. initiative. Mm. And I recall when we were in power, when even we were doing so well under the corruption perception index, GI was all over the place. I mean, on every matter. And I recall most of the matters that we were even discussing at the time were actions taken by government to curb, to fight corruption. For example, the case of Jida. President Mahama himself, in fact, there was, there's something that people do not know. President Mahama was the kind of leader who would sit in the office and commission independent investigation into the various institutions without the knowledge of the officers. So your institution would be under investigation and you wouldn't know. I see. And it was commissioned by the president. I see. Yes. And most institutions went under investigation whilst we were in government. Mm. It was not because there was any scandal or any allegation of scandal. He just wanted to know. He just wanted to were, know what was going were. on. And that was what brought out the case of Jida. Mm. He actually handed over the report to the media. But it became his crime for fighting corruption in his own government. Guess what? The one who fell on the sword under the Jida scandal was President Mohammed's very good friend in parliament. They were all members of parliament. And he went to jail for that. And this is the kind of leader we are talking about. And that was the kind of response that we were getting from civil society about corruption here and there and all that. But here's the case. You have the murder serpent of corruption. That's what I do in nomenclature. <laughs> yes, the murder serpent supervising and leading and participating he said he is not. The in their corruption. He is not. But why? Do you, do we, do, does anybody have to listen to what the, do you expect the president to say that I am mad as a pen of corruption? Even, even though he's just clearing it, everybody and he has become he said the, he's the, not a clearing the, agent the, either. The, the, the chief clearing agent. He is not either, that's what he says. So do you expect him to accept that? He's not going to accept that. Mm. But look at the current level of corruption. Mm. How society is decaying. How, I mean, I mean, every single, every single day, mm. there's a scandal. And these scandals that we are talking about are not just mere allegations. Mm. They are scandals with evidence. You're, scandals you're saying with evidence. there's a book of daily scandals. I mean, sometimes it's hourly. One hour, one scandal. Well, what did GII say I when, sure you, when, when you raise these concerns that, look, in the past, this was what you were saying, even when we were trying to fight corruption, as you say, uh, and now with the levels that we see, what did they say? Essentially, the point that all of them have been saying, not only GI, I, I raised the same issue with CDD. I've raised the same issue with IDEC. I've raised the same issue with so many of the organizations. And it comes up to one thing. The environment does not help. Even when they put out statements, when they want to speak to matters, some media houses do not give them vent. In fact, the stories are killed. And so they are struggling. You understand? They are struggling. All of them. They are unable to speak. You would speak, and your story, in fact, it will not reach anywhere. It will not reach anywhere. The Nobody is interested. Killed by it, who? It is killed, deliberately killed. So, Donny, you know, advocacy thrives in an environment mm -hmm. where there is opportunity for free speech. And last time I was making the point that, look, the greatest thing that has happened to Ghana, advocacy in Ghana, is social media. But for social media, most of these institutions would have died. Because then it becomes very difficult to speak. And when you speak, nobody is interested. Because the system has been corrupted. You understand? But that was not the case some time ago. You see? So it's, it's, a, it's a big problem that we, we need to fix. It's a big problem we need. But you, I think that mm. civil society have a role to play. In a, both in advocacy and in governance. Okay. And it's about time that governments take not only civil society. Mm. I mean, all identifiable groups. Mm. Because 
it's a mobilization thing. In fact, public policy implementation is an act of mobilization. It's a product of mobilization. Right. If you don't mobilize, and that's why as social democrats, we believe in organized unions, mm. organized labor, mm. organized institutions, mm. so that it becomes easy when you are partnering, you are collaborating mm. in any public policy venture. And, and that, brings it makes it my, easy. that brings me to my next question. You also are the director of interparty relations. So the concept of winner takes all has been identified as one of our biggest problems in this country. Um, you can go back and talk about how President Kufo roped in you know, other people aside these party members. You can go back to Dr. Hila Lehman um, and, and the questions that people ask that, okay, so why don't we do that? Must it be just NDC people when NDC is in power? Must it just be NPP people when NPP is in power? Because clearly you can see some appointments being made. You can see the person is underperforming. Or misperforming but we still keep the person there and defend them in your interactions with the party did that come up and, and what would the ndc do well it, it has not come up but what has been striking mm. in our interactions is the constitutional review okay but you just feel short of mentioning president mahama mm. and president mills and our government was an inclusive government. I, I, I will, I will mention years. President Mills for the MMDCs in the, the, the first Even year. Even beyond President Mills, President Mahama. In fact, most of, I, I think there were two ministers that were put in this government that mm. were not in politics at all, that mm. were not NDC people. Mm. Pro Professor Jena Nopukwajima is one of them. Right. And Nano Yelita was one of them. Mm. Nano Yubampo now. I mean, and she was with you, the, uh, a bank for West Africa. Yes, mm. and she was doing the Commission for Human Rights right. Initiative right. and all that. She was in the civil society space. The prof was in academia mm. and all that. And it's replete. I mean, when you go to the lower level, you would even see CEOs who are not NDC. But people. we need to see a and, lot more. The people and, say, look, if we see a lot more, and we don't have patronage, oh, because somebody went to campaign in Bumpurugu Yoyo, -yo, so, so then he has to be given a position, even if I agree with he them or more. she is not. I agree with them more. Mm. But when a leader does little and he is not even recognized for the little, why will he do more? Well, <laughs> you understand. President Muhammad Peter, did all this. Peter, if what you did, um, the effect of what you did is not felt by the people, then it, it doesn't lie in your mouth to say you did little, you were not appreciated, so why would you do more? But Johnny, you had two cabinet ministers mm -hmm. who were not party people. Mm. who were either in academia, civil society space, because we wanted to build an inclusive government. And you, Johnny, do not even remember mm. to mention that. Mm. I mean, <laughs> it, it, what is, where is the motivation? Mm. I believe that inclusion is very key. And from the beginning of this interview, I've been mentioning inclusion. That's right. I believe that as NDC people, we may have some professional experts. We may have the knowledge we may have the skill mm -hmm. but most importantly when you are in government mm -hmm. the work of government and the knowledge of politics sometimes restricts you from taking certain decisions right. and that bringing people from outside mm -hmm. who are not originally politicians can be very critical mm -hmm. you understand but it can also be dangerous because again there is a political economy of public policy such that every public policy that you put in place, you must think about the political economy. You don't leave that out. Mm. If you leave the political economy out, you are going to fail. And so mostly, as political parties, mm. our decisions putting party appointees in place is most importantly beyond all the other competencies that we look at, beyond your background and the experiences you might have had before you came into politics, is the political economy, the right. knowledge of the political system, mm. so that you are able to make decisions that do not distort the political system. Mm. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole thing that we have to look at. But again, for those that make the suggestion that maybe we have to look at our constitution over concentrating power at the executive or in the hands of the president mm. is something that must be looked at. In fact, it is it is something that we ourselves, as a people, what, as a what political party... What would you party, advise your party... With our uh, leader, President uh, Muhammad uh, has seen mm. that we think must mm. be worked on. But you had the opportunity to work on it. I mean, he, his President Mills worked on it. The report was ready. Some say it was just left with implementation. Well, Nanado has come. His tenure is going. Implementation is what is left. It, it doesn't... It, it, 
it, it, I don't think we have to go back and review and re-review and re-review what has already been reviewed and put down. Can we at least implement pilot and then see that, okay, we got it wrong here, we got it right here, let's go back and review. Until that time, what are you reviewing again? I agree with you, mm -hmm. Tony. And that is why under President Mahama, after President Mills initiated the processes for the review, President Mahama continued with the processes. President Mahama couldn't finish the processes. And I recall somewhere in 2015, 2016, President Mahama was always speaking about how we should initiate and complete the process from parliament and get the referendum done and all that. And we couldn't do that before the elections in 2016, and we left off. President Mahama continuously had, in fact, every single platform. President Mahama doesn't speak about governance without speaking about the constitutional review. Mm. We consider the constitutional review process a necessity a necessary part of our processes to reform mm. governance in this country. And so we are committed to that. I recall two years ago, no, I think five years ago, was mm. it 2019, mm. when we, President Kufuado said he wanted to amend certain portions of the constitution right. to allow for election of uh, yeah, uh, assembly members on partisan lines. 55 that's an entrenched clause. Entrenched clause. And 2431. And, and, and we recall our 2431 is not entrenched. Yes. Mm. We recall mm. our argument at the time that, look, there is a whole constitutional review process that is pending. If we are ready to spend money on a referendum, let's put everything on the table and go through the process and do the referendum. But you see, there was an intent. It was driven by something. By what? We don't know the intention at the time. Mm. But our problem we had with the process mm -hmm. was that we cannot introduce partisanship into the assembly system mm. at the lower level. Mm. And the argument was that when we, when we drafted our constitution in 1992, mm -hmm. the intention of making assembly elections non-partisan mm -hmm was because we believe that having, you know, prescribed the participation of chiefs mm. in the politics of mm. the country, mm. you must give them some room to participate in the local politics. Okay. And so we did it that way so that chiefs and traditional leaders can contest for assembly members mm. and serve at the assembly mm. and contribute to national development. Mm. We felt that if you amend that clause and introduce partisanship at that level, mm. you would have collapsed that fundamental principle. But of times the have changed, and, and we see chiefs now publicly endorsing uh, politicians. Times have changed. We see now that uh, people go for assembly elections, unit committee elections. You see the poster, and you see this one. It looks NDC. This one, it looks like MPP. So it is your mind. That no, one it is, is in not, your it's mind. It's not about the mind. I mean, you go into the. I do a lot of community work. You go into the communities, and, and I've done community work for more than 15 years. You go into the communities. Election is happening. Say, oh, uh, one, one, four, him, and then one, three, one, four, him, and then that. So they, they tell you, you yeah, four. This one got two. So let so, me explain so that in, to you. In, in an electoral area where you have, for example, eight electoral areas and eight assemblymen, it's so oh, NDCB and a four, it won't one, four. They say it on the ground. It's, it's, it's not somebody imagining it. Okay. It, it happens on the ground. Does so it not? The assembly elections is non-partisan, mm. but. It in, is on, it, on paper. It is non-partisan. On paper. But it is not a political. Mm. It's a it's a political election. And your background do not matter mm. whether you are a party person mm. in party A or party B mm. or a chief or a journalist. Mm. It doesn't matter where mm. you come from. Mm. Even though it's political and has to do with elections and you have to campaign, mm. you cannot campaign on okay. any party's That's line. And that is the meaning of not being mm. partisan. Mm. Okay, good. So you can have an MPP constituency executive mm -hmm. contest assemblyman. Right. It's not against the law. It's not prescribed. When you, when you know that people are using that as a trump card to become members of parliament. No, I'm coming. And there are too many examples of that. No, Johnny, so, so if, Even John Mahama, the flag bearer of the NDC, he started from that point. No, but he was, in, but so, he was so not and, starting and, as and, NDC. And, he didn't and, start and on not, the ticket of NDC. And not just John Mahama. I can give you many people in the MPP as well who always will lay claim and say that oh, I started as this. When you contested school prefect, mm. you were compound prefect mm. in secondary school. Mm. You understand? Mm. How does it do with any I, party? I was you were, elected. Yeah, you, you, you were elected. <laughs> but the so you, cont you contested and you got elected. Mm. You know, it's, it was political. Mm. You, were, you were contesting for a political mm. office, mm. but not a partisan office. Mm. And so 
assembly contesting for assembly elections and later on ending in any party does not in any way mm. make it partisan. But the president, and that's the point. The president, the president believes that your party ditched the processes because this was a campaign promise that had been made in 2016 to be fulfilled in 2018. And then, well, okay, so to be fair. It's a defective claim. It's a very defective claim. How so? And the, the evidence is replete. I mean, the processes that we started, every step of the processes, and I recall, you can go and pick the State of the Nation's mm. address of President Mahama. Mm. Almost every single State of the Nation's address, he had encouraged the process to speed up so that we go through the constitutional mm. review. This is somebody who has shown enormous commitment to the processes of the constitutional would, review. Would you advise? And I have said again mm. that after he left power, mm -hmm. every single opportunity to speak on governance, mm. he talks about constitutional review process. And so this is something that is that is dear to the heart. Would, of would the you president. advise your party as the coordinator or director for inter-party and civil society, um, what do you call it, organizations, to say run an all-inclusive... inter-party and in civil society relations. Great. Mm. Run an all-inclusive government so that if you go to, for example, um, IDEC and you see Dr. Akwete and you think Dr. Akwete can be your best foreign min affairs minister, it doesn't matter who is in your party who you think has been talking about foreign affairs issues. Put Dr. Akwete there, clean and simple. Would you advise him to do that? If, if there is anybody in the NDC who is more competent than Dr. Akwete, I wouldn't go for Dr. Akwete. Okay. But if there is nobody who is mm. competent than Dr. Akwete, I'll go for Dr. Akwete. Helen. And, and, okay, and, and President Mahama, as I said earlier, mm. has shown that he can do that and mm. he does that. But beyond that, mm -hmm. beyond that, you see, we shouldn't make it seem like the fact that you are a politician mm -hmm. and you join a political party, then you are not a professional anymore. Mm. Remember, there are, we have we have top professionals right. in the political party. Right. You know Professor Bayou. Mm. Professor Bayou. Bayou. Yes. Is uh, a, Ghana Medical Association. Yes. Mm. He's a candidate for Lambusi. Right. This is a professor of medicine mm -hmm. who is teaching and has been in the classroom for years. Right. And he's joined politics. Mm. So for somebody like that, you would say that because he's a politician, we should go for somebody else to work. I am mm. a politician, right. true and true, from mm. beginning to the end. Mm. I'm an agric economist and a chartered financial economist. Right. So, for example, things about a great policy. Mm -hmm. I and I, in fact, I'm a practitioner, mm -hmm. not just you right. Know, you have farms and, as well. I, I, I'm a practitioner, mm. and beyond that, I'm in academia. Mm. And so, there is an opportunity. Then you say, Don't go for Dr. Otokuno, mm -hmm. we should mm. go and look for somebody who mm. has not had that political experience and also perhaps mm. may that, not that's, have that's, had that practical that's not experience. Their suggestion, but I'm sure that in uh -huh. the league, so no, I'm league, just drawing, I'm just yeah, drawing your I, attention I, I, I that these are the that. realities of I, making decisions. I, I, for appreciate, appointment. I appreciate that, but in the league that we you play there are also professionals that you know who are equally as competent as you are so for example if you go to the greek ministry or the health ministry as we have now i mean the health ministry now is being managed by a medical doctor previously the health ministry was managed by a chartered accountant with a deputy as head a hairdresser deputy and another a lawyer i mean this is the health ministry you're talking about you, you get the point how do you have a health ministry and the person doesn't have any idea about anything health? It's a chartered accountant, deputized by a hairdresser. How, where, which country would you find that? You know, the, the accounts have a say. Say that what? The Papodintin Yauba Yatudi. So this one, you are trying to mention them that the MPP government they put. No, a I'm, I'm just using as, one example. You also <laughs> had a dining hall prefect as a deputy minister. We, we, Under we, your administration, we dine your prefect. The one who ah, six, you, you you were compound prefect. If yes. today we make you a minister, does that mean that I'm you don't know anything? I'm a communication specialist. Yeah, you are I'm not talking. So the person that you are talking about didn't just jump from compound the, the, prefect to become the, a deputy the work, minister. We're looking for work no, experience. The Donnie, only work experience that was presented to Parliament. Donny, that's absolutely false. Mm. It was not. No, absolutely What's, false. What is it? This gentleman. The name no, 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 no. It was not Otibless. That was Akando. Not Mintakana. That, that was Mintakana. Mintakana. Yes. Okay. 
And that was his secondary school, mm. you know, position that he stated. Daniel Hall Prefect. But this is somebody who had gone through. Daniel Hall Prefect. This is somebody who had gone through several processes in his life, mm. gone to the university, right. finished the university, mm. worked in private sector, worked in public sector. So why did he not, this, put, I mean, why did not put it on Akando, the CV? Akando is one of the biggest rice farmers in this country. I know. But How why did you he, say that he's, a, why, he's a compound relax, prefect, so, so he doesn't qualify. So why did he not put it on the CV? <laughs> no. So, uh, uh, there, everything was there. You were interested in compound We prefect. didn't fight, but it was Are on you, TV. It was Danny on TV. It was on TV. Johnny, you were interested in Danny No, Hall it prefect. was on TV. It's not me. It was on TV. You were interested in that. That's why you was, it was one. captured on the hazard. <laughs> Helen. Quick one, Doc. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, I was listening to Dr. Amakoba. He's a leading member of the NPP. He was weighing in on the happenings at Jubilee Park over the weekend, um, listening to some of the um, ideas that the NDC is putting forth. He says the money is finished. He says there's no money. Again. So the cautionary tale to all uh, 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 parties seeking to take office is that there is no money. We, you and I know that there are some debts that are going to be due in 2026 and beyond and so on and so forth. With that in mind, how is the NDC balancing the reality of our very uh, dangerous fiscal space with some of the policy ideas and, dare I say, promises that are already being churned out? Are you thinking about where we are now? And juxtaposing that with what you want to do, how does that affect the plans you have moving forward? Okay, so so um, th that was the point I was trying to make, that the past four years, our team have just been thinking of ways out in the kind of economic quagmire that this uh, government has taken us through. And we are very much aware of the fiscal rigidities. In fact, the, the, a friend was telling me that we are suffering from, uh, uh, you know, Ichanga and Enoma. <laughs> <laughs> you know the story of Ichanga and Enuma. She doesn't know. <laughs> you don't know. Yeah, like Kukua and Mamiya. Ah, yeah. I'm you friends. know the, the, Obolo that, and so Fiska, Fiska Icha, Ichanga. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Uh -huh. And, and with you. that's the kind of situation that we have had to face. And we are also very much aware, <laughs> as recounted by President Mahama last Saturday, that the situation may be worse considering the fact that this government is not even truthful with economic data. And so mm. we are expecting even a worse situation. Mm. But that's the more important reason why we have been doing the past four years, thinking and cracking the, the fastest way to fix the economy, mm. the fastest way to, I mean, build some fiscal space, the fastest way to loosen up. We appreciate the kind of difficulties that the ineffective taxes the government have imposed is having on business and on the, you know, the, the households. And we have made a commitment to scrap the yield levy and the COVID-19. Mm. But we have made those commitments advisedly with mm. the intention to look at measures to expand a base, the base of the existing taxes, mm. so that we would be able to expand our revenue. Mm. And, 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 and be able to I mean, open up the fiscal space a little because bit. Because that's what people we are know ask moving that, into how next do you, year. If you, if you promise to scrap certain taxes, then again, people will ask, well, how do you make up for that shortfall? So the, the problem with Ga the Ghanaian taxes is not the number of taxes that we have. Mm. It is compliance and the effectiveness of the taxes. Mm. You know, because of the loads of the taxes, it actually encourages non-compliance. And so there is a huge problem of non-compliance, mm. which we have to fix. And, I mean, if we had time, I was going to share uh, some uh, interesting scenarios okay. with you. Go, go ahead. And so, mm -hmm. and so we, we, our engagement with Guta, for example, mm -hmm. brought some very interesting angle. You have the case where some companies are on the flat VAT rate. Right. Then some are paying the 22% mm -hmm. VAT. Mm -hmm. And they are selling the same commodities. Mm. And mostly they are selling the commodities at the same market price. Right. And so you have those that are paying the VAT rate, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, making more margins than those big, big companies that are supposed to pay the 22% struggling with their margins and struggling because nobody, the, the consumers who go to the, the, the lower you know, right. markets because they are running the smaller shops and buy from them. That's right. And so they are having problems with their profitability and all that. Mm. And so what happens is that now they start understating the, the value of their business right. so that they can enroll on the VAT flat rate. You understand? Yeah. Uh -huh. And so a lot of people that are supposed to be paying 22% are paying the VAT flat rate. Because it's convenient Because it's them. convenient. Mm. And so that is tax avoidance. Mm. You understand? Uh -huh. And so if it's, we are... It's not tax evasion. It's not evasion. It's, it's avoidance. avoidance. Okay. You understand? Uh -huh. Using what you have said yes, to, to feel comfortable. To feel comfortable. And yet to satisfy you. You understand? Right. And mm. if you look at those um, foreign companies that are into trading, they are also playing very smart with some of these things. And they are going away with it. And so... It is 
government's strategy, fiscal strategy, mm. to make sure that you realign the existing taxes mm. in a manner that people are not able to avoid, mm. essentially, but also you are able to capture a large number of people onto their so, taxes. So, so Peter, for example, the MPP promised that we're going to broaden the tax net. We've heard this over and over again. And that we're going to target the informal sector, right? So you go to a construction site, for example, the plumber, the mason, the carpenter, still bender who are taking by day, right? Sometimes 120, 180, 150, 200. Yeah, some charge. Oh. Yes, yeah, some charge. Now, they are making, that's by day. If you calculate how somebody who works, for example, at the bank, who is a teller, takes by day, that person, if they work for 30 days, is making much more than the banker. But because the banker's pay goes through the formalized system, they deduct everything, income tax, yeah, this, that, 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 that. So that's why the government formed NAPCO and brought in Revenue Ghana. That model clearly failed because we know what happened to NAPCO. We know how much we spent. And government has only told us, been able to tell us how much we raked in. What is your plan when you say you want to broaden the base? What do you intend okay. to do? So, so you had introduced a very specific area that President Mahama has been speaking about. Mm. And President Mahama has been speaking about the informal sector, particularly those that are artisans. Right. And the artisans themselves, too, are very worried that they are not contributing to national development. Mm. I recall when we met the Artisans Association of Ghana, they spoke heartily about the fact that they are working in somewhat an informal setting. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, it affects their competitiveness, mm -hmm. even when it comes to certain jobs on the, in the Ghanaian market. Right. So you have the case where we are now exploring oil and they need underwater welders. And because of the, the nature of their business or the nature of the work they do, they are unable to qualify. Mm. And that they are looking at systems to regularize, certify, and as it were, identify and formalize mm. their, their works. Right. And President Mahama has been speaking specifically about that. And he said we should have the artisan's voucher payment system. Okay. Which artisan's voucher payment system would mean that any artisan that works for you, mm -hmm. so with 3FM, you need an artisan to come and do painting, right. to come and do some, some mason work. Mm. When you are to pay the artisan and he charges you, you have agreed on 1500 on right, workmanship, right. you would generate a voucher, mm. a voucher code to pay okay, okay. so that that voucher code would have that automatic deduction okay. of the income tax. Okay. And we are, in fact, our team is still thinking about how we can, we can, you know, define. Mm. Sorry, Doc, who, who would do that? The, the person who's you getting have to the enter, services? Like just like yeah. you do for VAT, so, um, so just ah, withholding okay. tax and all of that. So, so okay. for example, you have worked for me and I'm going to pay you. I mm -hmm. would use a PIN to generate your code. And so this will require some formalization and registration mm. of all the artisans. Mm. Uh -huh. mm. And so that means that every artisan, if it's amazing, will have a working code. Mm. And that he works as a mason. Mm. Uh -huh. and, and, and what do they the get? What do they generate? get in return if they comply? They they pay. What do they get? That's in where return? tax integrity comes in. Mm. Tax integrity is having a government that is responsive in the application of revenue, that does not spend recklessly, like this government have been doing, mm. spending about twenty thousand dollar an hour on you know private jet when you have a private jet and all that, and all those things are not straightforward indicators that one would, would make some determination to, but s integrity of the government. Mm. And so people try to avoid taxes, become non-compliant, evade taxes, mm. because they feel that when they pay the taxes, they don't see the essence of the taxes. So my roads are bad, mm -hmm. and I'm driving on a very bad road, and I'm struggling with my shocks and spending all kinds of money on fixing my car, and you are collecting road too. They will have a problem with you. And see, so those are the things that, that constitute the tax integrity. And I believe that when you have a government that shows compassion and sensitivity mm. to the plight of the people, will not go and build cathedral mm. when the people are hungry, when you are running red, gold, green education, mm. and all sectors of the economy are struggling. I mean, some modicum of integrity is induced into the governance mm. process. It allows people to want to contribute. Mm to national development. Because when the kid, mm -hmm. the cake is rotten, mm -hmm. you will not get some to eat. Me too, I will not get some to eat. Mm -hmm. But the accounts have a saying, say, that? Say, da, mm -hmm. what, what does it mean? <laughs> when, when, the soup, when the soup is sweet, mm -hmm. tano, you know, I mean, we'll get take, some we'll to, get some to, to enjoy. taste. Mm -hmm. You understand? Uh -huh. And so, That's right. That is another version. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, every Ghanaian worker mm -hmm. knows that when he works very well, 
and he's able to contribute his quota to national development, mm -hmm. and the government is responsive to his needs, he will contribute more. What, what do you say to your party base who believe that, well, your NDC is not communicating enough, you are not messaging hard enough, you are just counting on the complaints that Ghanaians have and, and the frustrations that they are going through, all of us, which the president ag ag accepts and acknowledges, s to win the elections. What do you say to that? And what do you respond? Well, what response do you give to them? I don't know. I'm asking you. Good. So clearly, <laughs> sitting in this studio, I have tried to avoid the lamentation, mm. and I've been speaking to specificities mm. and how we think that we should be doing certain things. Mm -hmm. Whichever issue that you have raised, I've stayed on the specificities. Mm. I've even not cited m examples of how this government is failing. Mm. And so for those who would make yeah, such claims, yeah, I'm sure uh, any time you encounter them, you should tell them that the NDC is on message. Mm. We have been very fixed on message. Mm -hmm. Look at our outdooring of our running mate. We were fixed on message, mm. point by point. And if you listen to last Saturday, every speaker that you heard mm -hmm. was talking about something specific that the NDC will do mm. when given the opportunity. We believe that whatever it is, the economy is right now. Mm -hmm. Everybody is feeling it. You when you go to the market, mm -hmm. when you give your wife job money, mm -hmm. she comes back and complain. Mm -hmm. The tomato is expensive, the mm -hmm. onion is expensive, mm -hmm. the gari cry is expensive. You understand? So everybody is failing it already. Mm -hmm. There's no need for me to come and tell you how you are failing, but I can tell you how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have been doing. Mm -hmm. If you listen to NDC very carefully, we have been on how to fix the economy mm -hmm. rather than lamenting on you, the You presented of that blueprint to Ghanaians in 2020 and they rejected you. What makes you think that in 2024, if you present that blueprint to them, if you modify the blueprint, they would give you the chance? Two things. Mm -hmm. First one, we were not rejected because of the blueprint that we presented. Why were you rejected? Second, we lost the elections because the elections were contrived. It was stolen. It was a stolen verdict. I don't understand. And so the people did not reject us. Mm. And you could see that from our parliamentary representation. The people endorsed us. They actually endorsed the message of hope. They endorsed the people's manifesto. Mm. And as you would recall, most of the reviews of the manifestos of the 2020, 2020 elections, you know, came out that the NDC had the best manifesto. For mm. one of the best ever to be written in this country. Mm. And it was because we went out there and listened to the people. And so it was not about message. Mm -hmm. There was something beyond messaging. Mm. Elections and politics, it's not all about messaging. Mm. It's mostly, particularly in African democracies, about how you manage your elections. Mm -hmm. You understand? Uh -huh. And so you could have all the brilliant ideas. You could have all the smart ideas, mm -hmm. workable ones. People could see that these are feasible. These mm -hmm. are going to work. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do the right things in the electoral processes, you are out. And so that is why this time around, our focus on elections have been outstanding. Mm. You would see that beyond the fact that some of us are working in policy, election processes are also going on rigorously mm. with much more attention than it used to be. So that beyond the fact that we have all the brilliant <coughs> ideas and we have all the workable solutions, we would also be able to secure the power mm -hmm. to be able to implement them. Because if you don't secure the power, the ideas remain in, remains in the book. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I don't, you, you may not record the last time you picked the NDC 2020 manifesto mm -hmm. because oh, it may no. not be relevant to we you picked, anymore. We picked it yesterday, in fact. Oh, we are reviewing it yesterday. Yes, oh, we are. Lovely. I, and, and, I, I, and then the MPP manifesto I, as well. I, 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 I think I've missed that. I would want to listen to you on that manifesto. Mm -hmm. I think that manifesto is one of the greatest pieces of mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. of the NDC because of the what went into it. Mm. And I believe that what is coming up would even be bigger than the last there, time. There are 1.9 million unemployed young people in this country. And that's dangerous. Heavily dangerous. Um, for example, in the area of recruitment into the security services, I've heard people say that, well, you see how the MPP is pushing people in there. When you come, you have to do the same. If not, we'll have trouble. What do you say? Johnny, the reality of politics mm -hmm. is, is something that, you know, can be frightening. Mm -hmm. Indeed, they, it's not only you that they are talking to. Our people actually threaten us. Mm -hmm. That when you come, you see what they are doing. Mm -hmm. See how they are hunting our people. Mm -hmm. You see how they are, they, are, they, are, they are being partisan. You see how they are excluding our people. When you come, don't do the same. Mm -hmm. Don't do further for all. Mm -hmm. You recall last the three weeks, four weeks, when mm -hmm. President Mama had the mm -hmm. encounter. The media men were asking that we hope you don't become father for all. Mm. So you see, everybody will be demanded, and it's a natural human instinct, mm -hmm. a pound of flesh. 
in coming back to power are people who have suffered under the blunt, you know, leadership of the Akufuado government, mm -hmm. Akufuado Baumia government, would be expect expecting some pound of flesh. Mm -hmm. And so that is the reality of <coughs> humanity. Three and so nine President Mohammed's biggest problem coming into power mm -hmm. may perhaps not be how to fix the economy because we believe we can do that. Mm -hmm. It would be how to manage the people. But you insist that it the economy be, has been it, mess, it, it would, messed up beyond what, I mean, an eight-year period would have. Dr. Marco Barnett said that the money Indeed. is finished. Um, stop promising because <laughs> if you come, you can't fund it. You know, you, when you we inherited that, government... You that in four years you can fix the When we inherited government mm -hmm. in 2008, the money was finished. Mm -hmm. The money was absolutely finished. It was worse, not worse than the current situation. Mm -hmm. But we were able to do it in four years. In fact, by the second year, by 18 months in government... Mm -hmm we were able to move inflation from some 24% mm. to a single digit. And it stayed like that over 30 months. Mm. We were able to grow at a rate of over 14%. Mm. We did that in four years. So what is the scare? So COVID, there is evidence. There is evidence mm. that this government has done it before. So COVID, President Russia, Mahama, Ukraine doesn't coming, worry you. President Mahama was actually the head of the economic management team at the time. He was. Yes. But why does the NPP say and, he wasn't? Well, I mean, what do you expect from the NPP? Mm. Would you expect anything better? You don't hold any expectations. So COVID, from Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine doesn't worry so, you. So what? 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 What is the effect of COVID, Russia, Ukraine? Uh, you haven't COVID, you heard Russia, Dr. Baumia, really? You haven't economy. heard Dr. Baumia's? No, I have heard him, I mean, several times. Mm. And I have made the point that sometimes I feel very disappointed being somebody in academia and, I mean, a student of economics and having president or uh, vice president uh, Baumia mm. as an economics PAD holder, mm. you know, make such claims. I feel very worried. And the reason why I feel very worried is that Ghana is not an island, though. Mm. But the global implications on our economy, mm -hmm. most importantly, when it has to do with food, mm -hmm. when it has to do with the performance of inflation, mm -hmm. which mainly, mainly is driven by food prices, Three, you can't put eight, the burden on COVID and Russia-Ukraine. Because one, COVID. COVID was a blessing than a curse to this economy. I see. COVID brought in $7 billion dollars. Manage that we never dreamt that we would ever have in this country. COVID mm. brought seven billion dollars. Seven billion dollars in Ghana City will be how much now? Sure. Do the simple math. Times fifteen, yeah. And see how much money came into the economy. And uh, 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 Johnny, these were not loans mm. with interest to be paid. These were grants. In fact, from two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. we have never had such level of grants into our economy. Go and look at our budget mm -hmm. and look at the grant portion. After, after we joined HIPIC mm -hmm. and we got the HIPIC reliefs and the debt reliefs at the time, we, when we moved under President Mills, we moved to a middle income economy. Mm -hmm. We lost all our you know, grants. grants. We're not getting grants. Mm -hmm. Akufuado alone, within a matter of two years, mm -hmm. had $7 billion grants. And you know what it means? For an economy mm. to have seven billion dollars injected into your economy, that economy shouldn't suffer again. But Doc Swift, Swift in for intervention on this one, and this comes up time mm. after time. Mm. And what you hear a, a government actor say is that, well, we had lockdown. Um, staff were still paid when they weren't going to work. The private sector had to lay off a number of people um, and that caused, you know, turbulence in the market. We're not making as much money because businesses couldn't survive. They'll talk about things like the free food that was distributed. I won't go to the free electricity and water because you guys will lynch me. You say it's no longer free. Right. At the time, government said it was free. So those are the things for which they say um, caused that uh, turbulence because of COVID. Yes, we got that windfall, but government actors say, oh, we were paying people. They okay. were at home. So, so how do you respond to that? So, so, first of all, how many people were paid during the COVID period? How many people that were not working? Mm. Apart from those on government payroll, mm. how many people did the government pay? How many people were fed? Let's do that estimation. Right. Let's look at the audit report. Mm. What it says right. about the COVID. Right. Mm. You understand? Now, let's look at the private sector. How the private sector suffered. Okay, the private sector suffered. That's what right. stimulus was given to the private sector? Mm. Did the government mm -hmm. give any single stimulus to the private sector? No. Now, 
the issue about the seven billion mm. which comes to government but they, they get MBS is supposed SSI to, loans yeah, yeah it, it's, it's supposed to fund government business mm. government investments government stimulating the economy mm. now how much of that money went into government stimulation of the economy through the private sector the nbssi loans that were giving to uh private sector nbssi loans has been i mean it's been in the system we've been well, giving but, that but, the but you i'm sure you heard that government says oh we give nbssi loans but need, now what is gea it is completely immaterial when you look at the seven billion dollars injection mm. my point is that that seven billion dollars was not a case mm. it, it was a blessing in disguise nobody ever mm should have the confidence or even the temerity to use COVID as the reason why we are in this crisis. We have to go. Tony, we mm. were in COVID mm -hmm. not as an, an island, mm. but the entire world were in COVID. Mm -hmm. So go to Ivory Coast, see how the economy is doing now, mm. and see whether they suffered COVID, like worse than we suffered. Mm. Go to Togo, go to Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is now having challenges with their democracy. They have a military ruler. Mm. Go and see how the economy is doing. And tell me that COVID-19 is still a problem in mm. Ghana after getting the $7 billion. We, we have to tell me that Ukraine-Russia war, mm. Ukraine-Russia war mm. is a problem for us. When indeed even those war-torn areas and the coup d'etat hits areas mm -hmm. are doing well in the case where they have even support from Russia and all mm. those things. Mm. So, I mean, nobody can make this you know, uh, statements mm. and go away with it. And I, sometimes when I listen to radio, I feel very worried when anybody from the MPP says that, oh, COVID-19, Ukraine war, then the person is left to go, just like that. I, I feel very deeply worried. I hear because you. I think that the implications of those international crises on our economy would have been very minimal mm. or virtually non-existent if we had the right managers in government. Indeed, look at the COVID level. The past few years that they brought in the COVID levy, mm. how much money has the COVID levy alone generated? Mm. They should quantify how much cost, the social cost, the economic cost that COVID-19 brought to the state. And let's look at the social revenue mm. and the economic revenue mm. that we got from COVID-19 and put that side by side. Do the cost-benefit analysis mm. and tell me that COVID has affected your economy. Would you take one of the phones that Dr. Baumia is offering for you to pay a long term? One Ghana, two soon? Ghana. Would, one you, Ghana, would you take two that? Ghana. Would you take that? One Ghana, two Ghana. Yeah. People are hungry. They are looking for jobs. They don't have jobs. But they can use the you phone have, to do more business. You, you, you have a presidential candidate mm. telling them about how to get one Ghana, two Ghana phone. To go and do what? To do what? Momo business. Mo Momo business. Yes. Seriously. Which Momo business? The Momo business that they have collapsed. Because of the yield levy, mm. you know most of the Momo businesses have collapsed because of yield levy. They've, they've closed down. Mm. You understand? And so, I mean, I think that this government is living about reality. <laughs> Doctor Baumia is behaving like a sport child. I, I it, somebody said he's a special child. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but <laughs> but you know he's behaving like an overpumped child, mm. and he's not being serious with the people. Of this country he's become jocular he's become i mean the uh, uh, I, I, let me be very careful but, but you see mm. i think that we must take Ghanaians serious johnny Ghanaians mm. need serious leadership a leadership that is sensitive to their needs and their plights and i think that our friends mm. are not offering that mm. what our friends are offering it's an insult to the people. Mm. They are not feeling what the people are feeling. Mm. And it's like somebody hurting you and teasing you at the same time. Mm. Like somebody beating you and preventing you from crying. And that's what this government is doing. But the President Mahama mm. is offering hope. President Mahama is ho offering honesty. Mm. President Mahama is telling you that I know your reality. Mm. I share in your reality. Mm. And I want us to fix this together. Let's build the Ghana we want to What end. percentage is Let's winning the election with? Well, we are very optimistic that we are going to win massively. By? But I don't know the percentage yet. It is only God who knows the percentage. But what I can assure you... Will you, you be in a comfortable lead? What I can assure you... Will Johnny, you be in a comfortable lead? What I can assure you... Will you, you Johnny, be in a comfortable lead? What I can assure will you... Will you be Johnny, in a comfortable lead? What I can assure you, you Johnny, is that lead? we are going to win super massively mm. in this elections. 
and there is there is no gin mensa mm. there is no police there is no military mm. there is no judiciary mm. that is going to stop us from winning this election and on 7 january mm. we are going to swear in president john mm. ramani mahama mm. as the president of the republic give me one chubu give me one chubu which of the chubu is chubu <laughs> 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 